Hey everyone, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So if you watch any of my other videos, you've probably come to the conclusion that I'm a bit of an optimist. When it comes to these devices, I like to take all of them in and try to figure out what it is I like about them and some of their redeeming qualities. Well, I have to admit, I finally met my match. This thing is called the Trim UI Model S. And it's this tiny little micro console that's supposed to play all these retro games. It's super small, it can fit in your pocket, it's about the size of a credit card altogether, and it costs $50. And for the first time ever on this channel, I'm going to say that unless you love collecting these little devices, I think you should steer clear of this one. Okay, let's talk about the specs on this little device. So it runs on an all-winner F1C200S chipset, which runs at 628 megahertz with a single core, and it has an entire 64 megabytes of RAM. It features a 2-inch IPS display with a plastic laminate on top of it, and it runs a 320 by 240 resolution at a 4x3 aspect ratio, which is the same as the RG350. It has a small 600 milliamp hour battery, which results in about three and a half hours of playtime according to the website. And the truth is, I never played it that long in order to see the battery go down that far. And like I mentioned, it only costs $50, which is a bit of an impulse buy, and it has multiple different colored shells, and they're actually pretty impressive looking. When it comes to gameplay, this device is set up to play Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, Sega Game Gear, and then also Neo Geo and other arcade games. But as I'll show you later here in this video, the experience is not as great as I was hoping it would be. And to be honest, the firmware is so locked down that I'm not even sure what arcade emulator I'm using. I don't know if it's MAME or Final Burn Alpha or something else. I have no idea. And I guess that's one of my big issues with this device, is even though I own this device, I feel like I don't actually own it because I actually can't get inside of it. It's very closed off to me. And that would be fine if everything worked perfectly, but it doesn't. Now, if you go to the Trim UI website, it's actually very impressive. They have some very nice modeling here, but then the cracks start to show. So for example, it shows that it's compatible with PlayStation 1, PSP, Dreamcast, Atari 2600, as well as for some reason, the Wii Classic controller. But none of those systems play on this. It only has the NES and the Game Boy of all those systems actually set up. So let's do a quick unboxing. And I have to hand it to them. The marketing in this is really good. Even this box looks very nice and professional. It's much better than, for example, a Pow Kitty box. If I saw this sitting in a shelf in Target or something like that, I would actually be compelled to maybe pick it up. So let's open it up and have a look inside. So another thing that impressed me about this device is the entire instruction manual is done in English. And I'm not sure if they have other instruction manuals for whatever region they ship to, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that I could read the entire thing and that the instructions were pretty comprehensive. Now it came with a micro SD card and you can see it has no label on it. It's completely blank, which makes me assume that it's just some generic SD card, but you never know. It comes with a tiny little USB-C charger and one interesting thing is the USB-A adapter is made in purple. I've never seen a purple USB adapter, so that's kind of unique. And I have to say, this thing looks very nice. I actually really like clear cases like this. I like feeling like I can see every component in the device itself. And I love this green metal back on it, and it has various colors, but I really think this green one's very nice. And obviously, if you haven't figured out from my background, I do like the color green pretty well. Going back to this clear case, it's pretty cool to be able to see the buttons actually move like that when you push down on them. And I have to say, the buttons feel pretty good. They're clicky, but not in a bad way. They're actually pretty pleasant to push down on. It has a single mono speaker, as you can see here, and then it has a start, select, and menu button. You can also see the USB-C charging port, as well as the SD card slot on the left. These buttons are very clicky, but it's okay, I was expecting that. Now this D-pad on the left here is actually very nice. It took me a minute to kind of figure out what I liked about it, and I think what I like about it is that it's part of this one single disc, and you can see the whole disc when you're pushing down on it. And it is a clicky D-pad, but not in a bad way. And it's definitely not something I'm used to, especially playing a lot of Ambernic devices. And it's not a bad experience. And it took me a minute to figure out what device this is similar to. And initially I thought it might be like the Retroid Pocket 2, so you can see here, which is also very clicky, but it's bad. Like, I don't like this D-pad at all. It doesn't feel good to use. And then I figured it out. It's like the PS Vita pad. 
It has that same kind of rounded feel to it, a little bit clicky, you have a tactile feedback to it, but it's in a good way. So honestly, I think it's a very good D-pad. Now this device only has two shoulder buttons and they're very clicky. They're a lot like the start and select buttons. But because of the systems that are available on this device, you're not gonna use the shoulder buttons much at all other than for maybe Super Nintendo games. Now it's no exaggeration to say this thing is tiny. It's a little over two ounces or 65 grams altogether. That is tiny. Now the next smallest device I have, which is the Ambernick 280V, is almost twice the weight. It's 123 grams and 4.3 ounces. So the Trim UI Model S is half the weight of an already very small console. And I think a large component of that is this very small 2-inch screen. The RG280V has a 2.8-inch screen, and it feels like a monster compared to the other one. And you know, when I first got the 280V, I marveled at how pocketable it is. But this Model S just puts it to shame. It's a little bit taller than a pack of playing cards, but it's a lot thinner and a lot more narrow as well. This would be a really easy device to just take with you, throw in your purse or in your pocket. I also like that the D-pad and buttons are pretty flush with the device itself. It's not going to really catch on anything. And then the whole front of the device is covered with a single piece of plastic. You can see here there's no bump or anything between the screen and the rest of the device. Everything's encased in one single piece of plastic. And this metal shell is very impressive. I like that they used it. And luckily it passes my shake test. There's no rattling or anything else. So honestly, before turning the device on, I really liked it. But the moment I took this SD card, which is blank and generic, and I plugged it into the device and turned it on, that's when my problem started. So let's start a timer and see how long it takes to boot up. So as you see, it takes about 13 seconds to start up. And right off the bat, you're probably noticing it as well, everything's in Chinese. So I had to navigate through and figure out where the settings were, and then also figure out where the language settings were, which are the second menu item here on this device. So swap it over to English, and then I'm actually able to use it. Which is kind of funny, because the entire instruction manual was in English, but then the device ships in Chinese. Going into the settings, you can see various pieces of information about the device. And then you can see it has a favorites function, which I do like. And then under the retro game section, you can see it has all the emulators, including a PS1 emulator. We'll get to that in a minute. It also has a game section, which includes ports, but there's only three ports available. So when I first start up every system, it has to scan all of the games on the SD card. And it took a while. It took about a minute altogether. It got to the point where I was worried nothing was actually happening. But eventually it all started to work, and there's almost 3,000 games on here. And for the most part, they're actually in alphabetical order. But turning it on, you can immediately see there's some issues. So for example, there's no Game Boy full screen. And I don't think that's the end of the world. Maybe they're trying to keep it to one times resolution. But I wish they didn't have this fake gray Game Boy border around it, because it just looks a little weird. You can't even see the full battery label. It just looks really weird and cut off. But luckily, everything's scaled correctly, so I don't have any issues when it comes to the actual pixelization. And honestly, using the D-pad and the buttons, it feels pretty good. I like the clicky responsiveness of the D-pad, and it feels nice to push these buttons. And I immediately notice that there's some screen tearing. If you look at these palm trees, they're kind of swaying. And unfortunately, I learned that this is an issue in every single emulator, which leads me to believe it's not an emulation issue, but actually the screen itself. And it's very distracting. Now, one of the nice things about this menu is that it, all of them include box art. And for the most part, they included the English version of almost every single game. I also figured out that there are hotkeys that you can use while playing the game. So for example, if you hold down select and use the shoulder buttons, it'll turn the volume up and down. And similarly, if you use the start button and shoulder buttons, it'll adjust the brightness. But same thing here, I saw screen tearing playing this Castlevania game. And to close out of a game, you have to hit the menu button and then close out. There's no other options available other than to save state. And when I got back to the menu, I noticed that everything had reverted back to Chinese. And this happened over and over again for me. I had to keep going back into the settings, finding that language option, and then changing it back to English. And luckily it only takes a second, but it's still pretty annoying. Now when using the Nintendo emulator, I noticed this squeak sound. Listen to this. It sounds like there's a little mouse in the device or something. And Nintendo games look pretty good on this screen, 
They're not high resolution or anything, but the pixelation looks pretty good. But even after just a couple minutes of playing the game, the sound really started to annoy me, to the point where I started looking for a headphone jack to see if it sounded different than headphones. And then I realized there's no headphone jack on this device. Which I think is a huge misstep, because this is a device that you're going to grab with you and take with you somewhere. And so it makes sense that if you're on the subway or public transport or something, that you'd want to plug headphones in. But you can't. Now eventually I did figure out that you can use the USB-C connection to get audio. But that's kind of a pain. You need an OTG adapter, and then you need a USB headphone adapter. Unless you already have USB-C headphones lying around, these are the dongles you're going to have to set up in order to listen to audio. So I get all this connected, and I put it in my ears, and then I realize that the audio is only coming out of one side. So even if you had headphones that had a USB-C connection, you'd only be able to hear it out of one ear anyway. To me, the ability to use headphones isn't even a feature on this device. If you can't use both ears, why would you use them? And even though I think 320x240 is a pretty good resolution for a small screen like this, the problem is that at 2 inches, it just doesn't look very good to the human eye. Like on Battletoads here, you can see that everything is lined up correctly, they have square pixels, but at the same time, it just doesn't look very good. And there we are again, went back to Chinese characters, so I have to go back into the settings and change it back to English. So moving over to Super Nintendo, in addition to the screen tearing, I also found significant delays in the actual gameplay itself. So when I'm playing F-Zero, which is a game I'm terrible at by the way, I could tell it's about 75% of the speed it should be. And an easy way to tell is to listen to the audio. Listen to how it sounds when it's playing. And then when I pause it. It speeds up immediately when I pause it. So it cannot play these Super Nintendo games at full speed. And there's no options within the emulator to do any sort of changes or tweaks to anything. And another thing that bothered me about the Super Nintendo emulator is it doesn't even take advantage of the full screen here. It's letterboxed and pillarboxed. That doesn't make any sense to me. It should work just fine on a 4x3 display. Now the community has been working on updated emulators for this, but they're very complicated to get set up at this point. And honestly, in my brief time with this device, I've been so disappointed that I haven't even been motivated to change out the emulators because I don't think they're going to get that much better. From what I've read, there's been no solution to the screen tearing issue. And when I play a game like Mario like this with this obvious screen tearing, it's a little bit nauseating to me for some reason. It gives me like a little bit of motion sickness, which is kind of weird. Now one system that does look pretty good is Game Boy Advance. It still has those screen tearing issues, but overall the resolution looks pretty good on this device. It is a little bit letterboxed, I think they were just trying to keep it to the 3x2 aspect ratio. But when it comes down to it, the gameplay is pretty good. I didn't see any significant slowdowns, and I feel like a broken record at this point, but there is definitely screen tearing on this one too. Genesis games looked and played pretty good. I think they definitely play better than Super Nintendo games, and luckily it takes advantage of the full screen. And I think Game Gear may have been my favorite system to play on this device. Even though the screen tearing is still very distracting, I like that it's full screen, and I like that it's a handheld system you're playing, because then all the text and sprites seem to be in an appropriate size. And like I said before, I'm not really sure what arcade emulator is running here. I think it might be Final Burn Alpha, and this is probably the best looking of all the systems. I only saw a little bit of screen tearing, and everything plays at a high resolution and at full screen. So if you really love arcade games and you're able to figure out whatever the heck ROM set they're using here, this device might be a neat little arcade machine. And Neo Geo games play really well on this device, which is why I believe it's probably Final Burn Alpha running both of these two systems. But same thing here, if you like Neo Geo and you like arcade, I think if you filled up an SD card with the Final Burn Alpha ROM set, you might be pretty happy with this. But honestly, that's quite a compromise, right? For me to have to say, this is the only time the system does well, that's a failure. So plugging the SD card into my computer, there's just three folders. The apps folder is empty. And then there's an images folder, and this is where you put all your box arts. And this is actually a very simple setup. All you have to do is make sure your ROM names match the image names, and that they have the same folder name as well. So that's pretty easy. And opening it up here, you can see in the ROMs folder, it has just all sorts of ROMs thrown in there. So it's very easy to take these out and add your own in. So this is a win. And you know, because I saw that PlayStation folder, I ended up adding a couple PlayStation games as well as the box art, and they worked perfectly. I had no issues with it. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, since I was still on my computer, I went to the Trim UI website and just checked everything out. And I saw that they do have firmware updates, so I may install these and see how that runs. But for this video for now, I'm just going to stick with the out-of-box experience. 
I'm not quite ready to blindly flash new firmware onto this device until I do some more research, but I'll provide a different update video if I think it's worth it. Just a quick thing to show you what it looks like when it's charging and then when it's turned on. It has a blue light when it's turned on and a red light when it's charging. And I like these little LED lights, but they are super bright if you're trying to play this thing in the dark. Okay, so like I mentioned, I added a couple PlayStation games. And you can see here they showed up just fine, as well as the box art. But given the fact that they had this folder and no games installed on it, I didn't have very high hopes for it. And obviously there are some major issues with it. Look at this, it's totally cropped out of the frame here. So whoever added this PlayStation emulator did not scale it correctly. And there's no ability to change any of these options. All you can do is change the volume and save and load states. That's it. When you actually play the game, it's like playing a slideshow. It's super slow, screen tearing is terrible, and it's so hard to see what you're doing. And I had read that 3D games on this device are super bad, probably because of the low specs of the processor, but this is just unplayable to me. I'm doing my best here and I'm running into palm trees. And unfortunately it doesn't get any better with 2D games. You can see here with Castlevania Symphony in the Night, the text is all over the place, there's this weird flashing on the right side. This is just utterly unplayable to me. And honestly, I don't think that would be a big deal if it played all the other systems well, but it doesn't. Super Nintendo sucks, Nintendo sucks, Game Boy's not good. At the end of the day, the only system that works well are the arcade games. Alright, so one last size comparison before we wrap up. My RGB 10 and my 280V are my two smallest devices, and this one is much smaller than those. And then if I take one of my larger devices, like a PS Vita, it's pretty amazing. This device is smaller than the screen on the Vita. So when it comes to being small and cute, it's a win. The problem is when you actually turn the device on. So let's wrap up my summary. So let's start with what I like about this device. I like that it has this very small form factor. It's very pocketable. It's kind of cool to just be able to throw this in your pocket and not even realize you have it on you. It has very nice build quality. It feels like a professionally made device. I think the ROM and the image management within the SD card is super simple. You couldn't ask for an easier way to organize everything. And I'm a sucker for clear cases. I just think it's cool to be able to see all the components. I like to have a unique and distinct item, and having these different colored back plates really feeds into that, so I really like that. And finally, I really love these face buttons and the D-pad. I wasn't expecting to like them as much as I did. I like that they're both clicky and responsive, and they're kind of fun to push down on. So let's talk about what I dislike. Number one, I hate this firmware. It's just terrible. To me, it's user unfriendly. I hate the fact that it kept loading the wrong language or that I had no options within the menu to make any sort of tweaks to any of the games. No button mapping, no screen ratio, nothing like that. I couldn't make any changes. And I suspect that the screen tearing is fundamental to the screen itself, so I don't think it's gonna be able to be fixed in any sort of software or firmware. And it performs very poorly out of the box. To me, I think that a $50 device should at least play Super Nintendo games well, and they're some of the worst games on this system, unfortunately. And this little speaker is kind of terrible. It has very bad audio and it makes that squeaking sound in certain emulators. And there's no headphone jack. And even if you plug it in via USB-C, you're only gonna get audio out of one earphone. At least that was my experience. When it comes down to it, there's no way that the $50 price tag on this device is justified in 2021. Maybe three years ago, people would have bought this device, but I think it's too little too late. So here's the thing. If you don't have any retro handheld devices, but you're looking to get one, this is not the entry point for you. I think you need to shop around and look at maybe a $60 or $70 device instead. Something like the RGB 10, which you can find for around $70, is going to make you 10 times happier than this device. I think it's worth that $20 price difference. When it comes down to it, the only people that I would recommend picking this up are going to be collectors, people who love to just have every little Game Boy Micro-like device. Because it would probably look pretty cool in a display case. And it is a neat little device. But in my experience, after using this thing for about a week now, I don't want to use it at all. I was hoping to be able to give this to my wife, to be able to say, hey, throw this in your purse and you can play Dr. Mario anytime you want. Super simple interface. And my wife's not a gamer in any way, but you know what? I handed it to her and she played it for a little bit. And 10 minutes later, she handed it back and she said, why is this thing so bad? And unfortunately, I think that's going to be your experience too. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. I hope you liked it. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.